Romans chapter eight, and <clears throat> this is one of the one of the best passages of Scripture. They call it the mountaintop of Scripture. And uh, I'm going to read this morning. We're going to read verse 28 to the end of the chapter. Romans chapter eight, verse 28. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text that's before us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful passage of scripture that lifts us up to the heavenlies, that reminds us of your great love for us, of your eternal purpose for us and how your plans for us do not change. They have not changed. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'll encourage us with this passage of scripture this morning. I pray that you'll use it, Lord, to get a hold of our hearts, that we'll uh, recommit ourselves to you. And I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here that doesn't know you, I pray that today will be their day of coming to know him, whom to know is life eternal. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I love the story of the old lady who was asked what her favorite passage of scripture was. And she said, my favorite passage of scripture is, and it came to pass. And the person said, why in the world is that your favorite passage of scripture? She said, well, because it does not say, and it came to stay. <laughs> it came to pass, you know. I think we can relate to this lady. Praise the Lord, it did not come to stay. You know, in life, there are times when what we want is just a way out. <laughs> we just want a way out of our circumstances. We get overwhelmed, so burdened down, and we say, Lord, when will this end? And it's at times like that that we take our Bibles and we go to a passage of Scripture like Romans chapter 8. And we read all the great encouragement that God has for us right here in our text. This passage of scripture is filled with it. I think of the encouragement of heaven. This passage of scripture in Romans chapter 8, the beginning portion of the passage, it talks about how the suffering of this present time is nothing to be compared to the glory that should be revealed after, the glory that should follow. Like, yeah, that's an encouragement when you realize that at the end of this life is heaven. At the end of the road, there is Jesus. That at the end of it all, the glory that's to come later is so great that this 
problems are nothing to be compared. Well, that's an encouragement, isn't it? And I think of the encouragement of this passage of Scripture about the Holy Spirit. It talks about He helps with our infirmities. We get so burdened down in verse 26 and 27. We don't even know how to pray. We don't even know what to say. We say, Lord, I, I, I don't know how to pray about this. I don't know what the solution is. And we're just praying and pouring out our hearts to God. And we don't even know what the solution ought to be. But the Spirit helpeth with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself making intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. That's a big encouragement, isn't it? When we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit does. He prays for us. He makes intercession for us according to God's word. This passage of scripture is the mountaintop of scripture. There's so much encouragement here. But this encouragement we're looking at this morning, I, I got to admit, it's hard to understand in that you read and you're like, really? The third encouragement, the one we're thinking of this morning is in verse 28, this great text of the Bible where it says, and we know. In other words, this isn't something we think. <laughs> this, is something, this isn't something that we hope to be true. This is something that we know. Know what? And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The, fact, the encouragement that whatever we're going through, whatever trial it is that we're facing, that God is working it together for good. You say, I don't know if I can believe that. I don't know if that's the case. I mean, I understand that the good things. I understand that the things that I like, that that is being worked together for good. But I don't understand how the negative things, how the bad things that happen, how any good could come out of that. It's a text that many have problems understanding, problems believing. But I want you to know this morning that God does not lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. And yes, there are times that we go through as Christians when they're difficult, when it's challenging, when it's a dark day, but know this, that behind the clouds, God is still working. God hasn't stopped working in your heart, in your life, working all things together for good. This morning, we're thinking of this passage of scripture, all things for good. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. How do we know that to be true? Well, number one, we know it to be true because of God's purpose for you. God's purpose for you. The fact is, no circumstance that you face, no problem that is in your way, no sin of your past, present, or future, no unforeseen trial of your faith that you go through is ever going to change God's purpose for you. And God's purpose for you is good. I think of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, and I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. God's thoughts of us are good. God's, thought, God's purpose of us is wonderful, and he's constantly working it out. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. What is that purpose? Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's purpose to conform us to the image of his son. Uh, talking here about predestinating us. And just a note here, the subject here isn't free will. We know that God gives us all a free will to choose him or not to choose him. 
whosoever will may come. But the topic here is God's purposes for his people. His purpose, his plan for those who are in Christ. It's the close of this chapter is on how God is at work in the lives of those who are in him. In the lives of those who have come to him by faith and believed on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have put our faith and trust in him, God's plan doesn't change. His purpose doesn't change. He, his plan will not be altered. He is going to conform us to the image of Christ. And someone says, well, I can't be sure that God's purpose isn't going to change because, I mean, that, wh what about the sin of my life? I'm not worthy of this purpose. I'm not worthy of God's goodness. Well, don't, don't you read what the text says? It says that he foreknew you. It says, in whom, and for whom he did foreknow. He already foreknew you, knew you ahead of time. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He knew you like Nathaniel, like he knew Nathaniel when he sat under the fig tree. He already knew him. He knew you before you came to him. He knew everything about you. He knew the kind of life you would lead. He knew uh, the, the things that you would struggle with. He, he knew all about you. And yet he still loved you just the same. He still loved you enough to send his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins. He foreknew you. And he didn't decide that you put your faith and trust in him. He, he, he foreknew you. He foreknew it because he's God. And sees the end of from the beginning. And no matter what tomorrow holds, he's predestinated you. He's pre-chosen your destination, predestinated you to be conformed to his image. God has decreed in eternity past that all those who put their faith and trust in Christ, all those in Christ, would be conformed to the image of Christ. Those who put their faith and trust in him are predestinated to be conformed to his image. And that doesn't change. It doesn't change. It, it, God's purpose, God says, I've purposed it. I also will do it. I think of the good in this text before we move on. We think of all things working together for good. And we think, well, this is why this happened. If this hadn't have happened, I, I would never have gotten this job. Or if this hadn't have happened, I, I never would have had these good things happen in my life. If this hadn't have happened, I never would have met this person. If this hadn't have happened, and we think of all the earthly reasons why it worked out together for good. Listen, I'm not saying that God doesn't orchestrate in the events of our lives to bring things like good blessings upon us. But he doesn't have to. I can tell you that. You read the rest of the passage. There's nakedness, there's peril, there's famine, there's sword. There are Christians that go through the fire, go through difficult, difficult times. But what is the good that he's always working out? It's that he's taking these things and he's using them to make us more like Jesus, to conform us to the image of his son. You see, when Jesus was on this earth, the father said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. The father loves the son. He's so in love with the son that he has purposed that you and I would be just like him. He's conforming us to his image. Through the different trials and testings that we face, he's taking his chisel and he's hammering away at us and he's making us more and more like him. He's using the different events of our lives, the good and the bad and all the things in between. And he, he's able to take them. It's not that God is the one that does the bad things that happen. It's not that God is the, at fault when someone does something wrong against us. But it's that God is able to take even those bad things. And he's able to use his hammer and chisel in our lives and shape us to be like him. To use it for our good to use it to make us the people we ought to be, the Christian we ought to be, to make us like his son 
the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, doesn't necessarily result in more earthly treasures. Doesn't necessarily result in, in more friends or better health or all our earthly problems being worked out. But it does result in us being conformed to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a wonderful work, don't you know? This is what it's talking about when it says the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed hereafter. That's the glory. The glory is the purpose. That's what's being worked out. It's that all these things that we're going through, God's able to use them to, it's not that it's just, you know, someone suffers or someone that goes through a hard time, you say, well, you'll receive equal compensation <laughs> for the negative that you received. You will receive an equal blessing. No, it's never equal. It's so much more. The, the negative, the hard times that we go through aren't even worthy of being compared. They don't even fit on the same scale compared to the blessings that God is working out in those that love him and those who are the called according to his purpose. Because of God's purpose for you, you know that all things are working together for good. And secondly, you know that all things are working together for good because of God's placement of you, where God has already placed you. Look at verse number 20, verse number 30. It says, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What God has done for you, it can't be undone. Where God has placed you, you can't be touched. You can't be moved. <laughs> He called us. He said to us, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He called us. He said, he said, who's, he said, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He calls us, whosoever will may come. And when we came, we were justified, declared to be righteous, justified, just as if I never sinned and never was a sinner. He robed us in the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he welcomed us into his family. And he didn't stop there. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans 8, we, we have a, a picture given to us of the future glory. The suffering of this present time isn't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Uh, we have a picture of what's to come. But do you notice that in this verse, it's not talking about the future. It's talking about something he's already done. He's glorified. It's past tense. It's something that he's already done. Then he also glorified. He's already done this. It's already happened. It's already taken place. And I'm looking at you this morning, and you're seated in the building of Missionary Bible Church, 5282 Kent Street in the south end of Halifax, up from Barrington in the Via Railway Station. I've memorized the invitation to church off of People's Gospel Hour from my years working there. But that's where we're located right now this morning. But uh, have you ever talked to a kid and you, and you realize he's, he's in a different place? <laughs> he's there, he's looking at you, but he's He's not really there. He's not really in the same room, it would seem, as you talk to him. Now my boys are looking. They were just in a different place. And now they're suddenly like, what's going on here? <laughs> well, you realize that for Christians, we're all in a different place. We're already in heaven because we're in Christ. And in Christ, we're already seated at the right hand of the Father. The parallel passage of this is Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and these are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start reading at verse number 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Ephesians 2 verse 4. Now verse 5. 
even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, hath made us alive, quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. And notice this, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. But you notice that in verse 6, he hath, he hath raised us up together. He hath made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're concerned about whether or not everything will work together for good. You're concerned about whether or not things will keep going the way you want them to keep going, whether or not God will keep working out his good in your life. Well, just know this, God's already got you up in heaven. It's a sure thing that everything's still going that direction. Everything's still working together for good. God's still at work in your life. He's already glorified you and seated you up there in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Jesus isn't going to move. So we're not going to move. We're always going to be with him. We're secure in Christ. All things work together for good. You can be sure of it because of God's purpose, because of God's placement of you. And then number three, you can always be sure that all things work together for good because of God's protection, God's protection of you. As you read down this passage, what you find is that it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Doesn't matter what anybody else does. Doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about it. Doesn't matter what somebody else's purposes are for you or what they want to do to us. God is protecting his child. God is on our side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now you remember what Jesus said. He said, I give unto them eternal life. He says that they are in my Father's hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them from my Father's hand. And I see the devil trying to, you know. I see him trying to wrestle us out of his hand. I see him taking his fiery darts and shooting them at the upright. He bends his bow to shoot at the righteous. He thinks that somehow he can bring something against him, something that will stop the progress, something that will stop the good that God is doing, that will work against him. But what can the devil do against God? What can anybody do against our heavenly father? The accuser of the brethren launches his attack. He says, I, don't you know what this person has done? Don't, don't you know the sins of their life? Don't you know that they are guilty? But it's God that justifies. He says, no, I see them as robed in the righteousness of my son. I see them as being clothed in white. I don't see any sin. I don't remember their sins anymore. I see them as righteous. He tries to condemn us. He says, he, he says, uh, he says, listen, he needs to be condemned. He needs to be punished for what he has done. But God says, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, walking by the spirit. In other words, not saved by works of flesh, but born again by the spirit of God, passed from death unto life. There's no condemnation. You know why there's no condemnation? Because we're in Christ. And Christ has already borne our condemnation. Christ died on the cross for our sins. It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also 
make an intercession for us. The devil points and says, hey, that man, he needs to die for what he has done. The wage of the sin is death. But God says, but Jesus stands there and points to the nail-pierced hands and says, I died for his sin. I shed my precious blood on his behalf. There is no condemnation for him because of what Jesus has done for us. The devil tries. He throws this. He throws that. He tries to do something to stop God's purpose that's so set in stone. He, he tries to do something to stop it from all working together for good. But God doesn't stop working for us. Christ is always there interceding on our behalf. He hasn't stopped working. He says, he that hath begun this good work in you will perform it. And in Philippians 1 verse 6, where that verse is, it's the idea of he'll keep on performing it. He's not going to stop. It's the continual working. He's still working today. And he'll continue working until the day of Jesus Christ. He's still working and conforming us to the image of his son. Nothing can stop that. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. What can stop this? What can get us on the other side of God's love? What can get it so that we're not, God is no longer working together for our good? What can separate us from his love? Nothing. Nothing. Not anything you can think of. This passage of scripture seems to be all inclusive has everything and everything in between, height nor depth. Nothing can separate us. You know, this text reminds us that Christians throughout history have faced dire circumstances. There have been tribulations. There have been distresses, persecutions. There's been Christians that have gone through famine, through nakedness, through peril, through sword. God's people in history have suffered greatly for him. Verse 36 is a verse that's quoted from Psalm 44. It says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Psalm 44 is written by Asaph, and it's a psalm of, a, of, of Israel, or Asaph talking about them in a time of righteousness, a time when they are doing what's right. They're not going after other gods. They're not, they haven't forsaken the Lord. They're true in their worship of him. And yet their circumstances are not what they thought it should be. They were going through all these trials, all these hardships. And, and Asaph writes and says, Lord, for, for thy sake, we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Don't you see what a terrible time we're going through? But the bad circumstances don't change what God is doing. Even through that, through the hard times, God still loves us. And he's still working all things together for good. You know, God's people were not promised an easy road. In fact, when you become a Christian, that, that seems to be what wakes the devil up. <laughs> that seems to be the time when it starts getting more difficult, more challenging. When you start trying to live for God, that's when the trials and tribulations start to come down. But the circumstances don't change your standing with God. Don't think that just because it's difficult that you must have it wrong. The devil wants you to give up. That's, he wants you to quit along the way. But God's still working. In fact, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not just that we win by a little bit. We win by a landslide like the Toronto Blue Jays against the Boston Red Sox when they scored 28 runs. 28 to 5 was the final score. It had an inside the park home run and with a grand slam. And uh, that was a, 
you know, that last night they won four to one. That's like conquering, you know. But 28 to five, that's more than conquering. That's just like, are they even playing the same league? And uh, we're more than conquerors. It's a landslide victory through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, you know, death. You say the, the worst thing I fear is death. You know how many people are scared of dying, scared of death. Yeah, but he walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. He's with us in death. We can fear no evil for he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. Life, now that's where all our problems are. Sometimes it's life itself. But even life itself can't separate us from him. Angels, principalities, powers, things more powerful than us. They're more strong than we are. But they're not stronger than our God. They're not able to separate us from him. Nothing present today, nothing to come. No height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. His purpose for us is unassailable. His placement for us, we, it can't, we can't be moved. The protection, the hedge he has about us, it can't be touched. This is the confidence we have in him. He works all things together for good. Do you believe that? It's so easy to be discouraged and to think that, Somehow these things aren't working together for good. So easy to think that, uh, to think that everything's bad, everything's going the wrong way. And to lose sight of God's eternal plan and what he's doing in our lives. I can't read this passage of scripture without thinking of Jacob in Genesis chapter 42. You know the story of Jacob, how Joseph was sold as a slave when he was 17 years old. And Joseph or Jacob goes the next 20 years thinking that Joseph is dead. The time of famine comes and he sends the sons down into Egypt. But jo Joseph says that you need to come back with your younger brother, Benjamin. And so finally it comes that they go down, that, that they come back and they say, dad, we need to go down again. We need to bring Benjamin with us. And at this time, Joseph, he thinks is dead. Even though he's king in Egypt, he thinks he's dead. Simeon had to stay behind. So Simeon, he assumes, is dead. And now they want to take Benjamin. And he says, all these things are against me. All these things are against me. Nothing is right. All these things are working for my bad against me. And yet, if he could only see inside Egypt and see that on the throne of Egypt, it was Joseph. See inside Egypt where Joseph was waiting with all the provision, with everything he could need. See in, in Egypt where Joseph was reigning, where Simeon would be free, where, where, where his family could make it through the famine. If he could only see the other side, he never would have said all these things are against me. And so it is for us as Christians. We see all these things as against us. But if we can just see the other side. We can just see heaven where Jesus is waiting. See glory and everything that he has prepared for us. We could just see how all these things that we think are working against us. He's working together for our good. To make us conform to his image. To work out that great glorious day. We never say all these things are against me. And this passage of scripture would be the encouragement it's designed to be. I wonder this morning, are you confident of this very thing? That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you know, as the text says, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to his purpose. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word this morning. Lord, this passage of scripture is such an exciting passage of scripture. When you think of your great eternal plan for us and what you're doing for us. And Lord, I pray this morning that it will just grip our hearts and that we'll see the good that you have for us. And I pray that we will have confidence in you and trust you as we face the the, the trials and testings that we have in this world. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every Sunday morning at Missionary Bible Church, we try to have a time to give you an opportunity to respond to God's word. And perhaps as a Christian, you're going through a difficult time and you're struggling. We'll take this time right now to pray and tell the Lord about it and restore and, and, and renew your confidence in him. And remember that all things are working together for good. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't have that same confidence because you don't know the Lord is your savior. Remember, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But in order to be saved, we must receive him as our Lord and Savior. Have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to be your Lord and Savior? If you haven't done that today, would you raise your hand? And I'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Anyone at all. Our Father, thank you for the time we've had in your word. I pray that now you'll bless in this closing song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.